Can I can I go down a potential rabbit trail with that? Oh, let's do it. To echo what you're saying, because this is super important stuff. I'm. This is sort of ground zero. Yeah. When it comes to so many things about the nature of God, the nature of man, an understanding of sin, and the mission of Jesus. So it's really good that we're here talking about this. <laughs> All right, welcome to Quick Show. My name is Greg Matson, and I am your host on this episode. We have my good friend, Pastor Jeff McCullough. We are getting back together after uh, uh, sitting down and going over our different doctrines where we find agreement, where we may not have find agreement from a previous episode that Jeff had run on his channel, Hello Saints. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Good to be here, Greg. Uh, one of the things that we discussed, in fact, even prior to when getting together on that episode that you ran was, I, I think we were in Salt Lake and, and we were talking about the Garden of Eden. And it became very apparent that a lot of our doctrines that we see very differently come from this, this account at the very beginning of the Bible that I think, I mean, I'm pretty sure that if you and I were to read through it, we're going to read the exact same thing. We're going to agree on all the same things that are happening there. Uh, as far as the events, but we're going to see it in a very different light. Did you see it that way? Yeah. In fact, this is a conversation you and I had a few months ago in the lobby of a hotel at an event that we were both at. And this idea of the garden came up and really quickly we started to realize, oh my goodness, like there are some, some pretty distinct understandings here that um, not a lot of people talk about, like in our respective areas. Like I've heard certain... Um, from evangelicals, um, sort of a, 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 a summary of what Latter-day Saints believe about the Garden of Eden. But as you began to explain it more detail, I'm like, whoa, there's a lot here. And I think it was at that point we were like, at some point, we need to kind of unpack this conversation. Yeah. And it seems that, you know, because a lot of what we talk about, and in fact, what we talked about in your episode is, has a lot to do with um, certain doctrines that that are maybe a little more focused. Well, I wouldn't say focused on the New Testament, but they're um, they had to do with the nature of God, right? That the nature of God yeah. is definitely a, a big disparity that, that we have. We believe in yes. the same Jesus who was born and his life events. And then it's like after that, it kind of gets a little nebulous for one from one side right. to the other. But so what I want to do is kind of like you did last time in that episode, I'm going to lay out a few of these beliefs. And then, and then I want you to kind of give your summary of before we delve in of what happened in the garden of eden okay so just a few yeah. things adam and eve were placed in the garden they could not have children in their current state that's a big one eve was beguiled by satan we believe because he told her she would not die not because he told her she would be like the gods it's another discrepancy i think the fall did bring about death and sin into the world but for Latter-day Saints, mm -hmm. we believe that the fall was a necessary step in the plan of God. It was absolutely necessary, and it was part of the plan itself. And because of the doctrine of a pre-mortal world that we have, this was already viewed by us and by God in the plan as an understanding of how this was all going to happen, and that our purpose would be to f come in the, in the first place. The purpose was always to come into a fallen world where we would experience adversity and have the chance to grow. And, and I'll, I'll say it now. And, and the other thing I think is really important in this distinction, Jeff, is that we would believe that the faith in Jesus Christ is not just an absolute necessary step because we're in a fallen world, but it was absolutely necessary from the beginning that that type of a relationship and trust and leaning on a savior would be absolutely essential for salvation. Yeah, a lot of that is um, kind of, yeah, it gets into the, the nuances there. So we understand and believe that um, the, the garden is the place where um, you really almost need to think of it from the standpoint of um, God's presence. That's really what it comes down to. The, the, the Garden of Eden, whether you believe that it is a, an actual physical, literal place geographically on earth, 
or whether it's metaphorically. And the only reason I say that is because in mainstream Christianity, there are a couple varying views as to whether we're talking about a, a literal place or something metaphorical. Mm-hmm. I lean toward literal, but there's no uh, discrepancy. There's no conflict, whether you view it as geographic or metaphorical. Sure, the um, truth can apply to both. The truth applies to both because, you know, you, a lot of what I'm going to say today, we have to understand that this comes from an ancient Near Eastern mind, an ancient Near Eastern context. So where we're very linear in the way that we think in the West and we see things in black and white, we're very logical, we're very forensic in the way that we understand um, things, we, we want empirical evidence. That's just not how the Eastern mind works. They think in pictures, they think more abstractly. And I think it's important to understand that there, there are so many aspects of, of ancient Near Eastern thought and poetry that's interwoven into articulating what things are like. Regardless of whether they were actual circumstances in an actual place, this is what things were like and why things are the way they are now. So, you know, uh, I think it's important to, to recognize that whether you believe the garden was, was literal or metaphorical, it, it represents, I'll just say that because this, it would apply both ways. It represents where the creator who is transcendent of the universe made a place in creation specifically for his image bearers. Okay. And um, we, we share purpose over creation with God in a way that no other creature um, shares purpose. And that is this having dominion and uh, being fruitful and multiplying and, and subduing the earth and tending to the garden. Um, that was sort of the, the, the rallying point as to where we can experience God's presence. And where God's presence is, there is life. So that's why you have the tree of life at the center of the garden. And, and that was really God's, his, his will, but that doesn't mean that he didn't know that we were going to fall. He did know. He gave us agency. He gave us autonomy because that's like God. God has autonomy. And so he does provide an opportunity for them to choose, which is the reason why you have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is the opportunity for God to say, if you are going to live under the conditions that I have set up, like terms and conditions, like we click anytime we sign up for something online, you can't violate these conditions because I am a holy God and I'm giving you access as my image bearers to my holy dominion. If and when in your agency you choose your own way rather than my way, you violate the conditions, um, then what did I just say? Where God is, there is life. He warns them, well, then you can't be with me and where I'm not, there's death. So surely the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die, which is essentially saying you will be banished from my presence where the tree of life exists. And he knew that that was going to happen. He foreknew it. He foreknows everything. He knew that he would be sending Jesus, which is Ephesians chapter one. So this wasn't a plan B um, as to why he would create us in that state with the potential to fall, knowing that we would fall. This is where I'm going to leave that. I think it's Deuteronomy 29, 29. There, there are secret things that are in the mind of an omniscient God that aren't ours. They're his. Um, but what he does reveal to us, that's, that's what we operate with. So we don't know exactly why he would set things up that way. But we believe, going back to the ancient Near Eastern understanding of things, that is how things were. And that gives explanation as to how things are. So you, you say that it's not a plan B. From a Latter-day Saint perspective, I, I think the response would be okay. So was, was the original idea that Adam and Eve, being the first parents, would be in the garden in this idyllic state, and then they would have children who would have children who would have children, and all of God's creatures, mankind, would have been born into the Garden of Eden in this idyllic state and in a, uh, a bond or connection with God to begin with if Adam and Eve had never partaken of the fruit? I think um, it is possible. That is the opportunity that God provided for them because we believe that he gave them the command to be fruitful and multiply before they transgress, which means they knew that they could do that and they would do that. As to why they didn't, we don't totally know. 
um, I think the prevailing evangelical view would be, well, they, were, they weren't in the garden long enough for procreation to take place. They were deceived so soon. Um, I don't know if I, that's what the majority of mainstream evangelicals believe now. I know that in the past it is. We don't totally know. But what we do know is the opportunity was made available to humankind to live in his presence, in his holy presence, getting all provision for life um, in, in a way that, that would have, have been good. That's why he creates all things with the cadence. It is good. It is good. So it was good um, until, of course, the enemy comes in and deceives Eve. They eat of the, the fruit and then is not good. Yeah. So that, I think that's the first major point there in, in looking at the difference in what we would look at as the overall framework of God and what he was trying to accomplish. Because it, for us, it would be, okay, you could not have had kids. And so we never were, for us, it was, there was never a plan for us to be in the Garden of Eden hmm. as mankind. And that though the commandment was given to multiply and replenish the earth, the only way that that could be accomplished was by partaking of the fruit. That, was, that would be a necessary thing. Because Adam and Eve would have been for us in some, you know, a... a uh, an innocent state, right? And part of that innocent state would be that there was no procreation that right. uh, that would have been happening. So that's an important thing. Now, here's another question. How then does does Satan beguile Eve? Talk to me a little bit about that because she's. we both agree she's beguiled, right? He's, Satan mm -hmm. deceives her. But we, again, we have a different take on this. Yeah. So there is a uh, there's a spirit realm that again exists in it, it is a realm of mystery to us, as far as we know, and this is through Jesus's words. Um, there was a hubris of Satan that led uh, to a rebellion. Um, as to what he is and who he is, uh, this gets into Latter Day Saint belief, where he is the spirit brother of us and Jesus and that we are the same species, we don't hold to that. We believe mm -hmm. that the, in that mysterious spirit realm, um, think about it like this. Um, again, ancient Near Eastern context. The gods in ancient Near Eastern context always lived in a garden and on a mountain mm -hmm. or on a mountain. You'd see that all throughout the ancient Near East um, in a place where their affairs unfolded. And by affairs, they just their their doings, their their god stuff, and their right? affairs, <laughs> and their affairs, right? Especially if we're talking about Greek mythology, right? And like eating children and whatnot. But um, I think to to the to the point though is that um, we're we're also dealing with this idea, this construct that in a Jewish sense, you have the creation and the creator, and the creator is transcendent; he is eternal; he is omnipotent, omniscient; he kind of arises above anything in creation, but the, those in his counsel in the spirit realm are creatures. Uh, they have a certain um, freedom. They have a certain uh, volition and autonomy. It, it, it isn't exactly like humans because we are the ones created in his image, not angels. But we see anytime we get a snapshot of heaven or of the spiritual realm, there are other beings that serve specific roles, some very clear, some not. And, you know, if you look at the book of Job, you almost you kind of see and this might come up a couple of times as we're talking this sort of mysterious arrangement that is made where you have almighty God who sits on the throne, who's providentially sovereign over all things. And yet you have this council, you have this these other beings who have certain wills that are limited and yet autonomous um, based on God's sovereignty, and you, you, this strange conversation between God and through Satan, you know, who are you, you know, who do you, are, lo are you looking to devour, whatever, I, I can't remember exactly how it unfolds, but um, this is sort of the mysterious realm of, of uh, an almighty God who has a council, who has a people, or not a people, but uh, uh, beings who are at his service, and there was one renegade through his pride who who wasn't okay with his position. And as a result, he went at God. And as a result, he was knocked down a notch. And God at that point is contending with or dealing with, not because um, he can't simply defeat Satan and call it. Again, this is going to get into the, the omniscient mind of a wise and righteous God. He saw it fit for his glory 
to keep things in that state where, where Lucifer wasn't destroyed. Um, where after what we see unfold in sort of this, this composite understanding of a rebellious leader or king in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28, which we sort of, again, we, we, we superimpose that on how we understand or the Jews understood the adversaries um, rebellion before Yahweh. Um, we now have this, this adversary who is anti-God. Um, and he is the one through his own agenda to come into the garden and to present to Eve something according to his agenda that is going to disrupt God's agenda for his image bearers, for mankind. So as, as soon as he starts to bring this, this temptation to Eve's attention, did God really say you shouldn't eat of, the, of the, the, this tree? Um, you surely won't die. Okay, that's a lie. Uh, yes, um, we would agree with that. It's a lie. Um, and then this is where it gets interesting, right? I can. You're, you're probably going to light up here as I say this. When he says, if you eat of the tree, then you will know good from evil and you will be like him. Okay, there's a half truth there. Now, this is how we'll understand that half truth. Mm -hmm. It is true that their eyes would be open to good and evil, but not in the sense, at least I might be speaking the gospel according to Jeff right now, but again, this gets in sort of a mysterious realm where there's a lot of kind of trying to put pieces together in a little bit of a cloudy sense. But by them eating, the, they, they knew what death was. Otherwise, God wouldn't have warned them. If you eat of the tree, you're going to die. If they didn't know what death was, they'd be like, well, that's not, that wasn't very fair. We didn't know what death was. They knew what death was. They knew what disobedience was but they didn't fully understand it. It's, it's almost like I understood marriage one way. I knew I understood the concept of marriage. I knew people who were married. I was the product of a marriage as a human being, but I didn't really understand. And my eyes weren't open to marriage until Joy and I got married and lights came on that otherwise could not have gone on. So when they're in God's life-giving presence, in his holy presence through the tree of life in this unbroken state, they went from a, an understanding of good and evil in a, in a conceptual sense. But once they entered into it and they knew that they were now on the other side of a holy but just God, things changed because they knew that they couldn't reverse what they had just done. And they remember what God said when he said, you will surely die. So Satan really was trying to torpedo um, God's plan for Adam and Eve. And as a result, that temptation led to the curses, which led to the fall, which led to the banishment of the garden, which is why we believe that what happened in the Garden of Eden was the most tragic thing that's ever occurred. Not the greatest thing. <laughs> Not the greatest thing, no. Yeah. So... A couple of things on that. So just to, to clarify our, our differences on that, um, we would agree with you in the sense that you, there there was a change after they partook of the fruit where they kind of knew about it, but they didn't really have a full understanding. Um, we would say that there was no real full opposition uh, in the Garden of Eden at the time. And that's the reason they needed to learn to try and exercise their agency is, is this was a very important part of the plan is getting the ball rolling on on having a full understanding of good and evil and mm -hmm. and being able to do that. Now, we would say, for example, we don't say that Eve or Adam sinned, right? Be, because of kind of what you said, we say, we use a, a lesser term, which would be transgressed, right? They transgressed would be they, they crossed over what God had said, and it's kind of the same thing, but we use a lesser word to say because they didn't have a full knowledge. They didn't, their eyes were not wide open at the time. And, uh, and so it's a little bit different at that point. Now, going back to the, the, uh, the two statements that, that Satan uses with Eve, I think we fully agree with the thou shalt not surely die is a lie. Mm -hmm. I would add something to that and that I think is very important that, quite frankly, I don't think a lot of Latter-day Saints understand. Dying there is not just mortal death. Right? To dying is sin. Dying is judgment. It's like Psalm 23, you know, with David. It's, Yea, though I walk through the valley, which is judgment. Valleys are all viewed in the ancient world as judgment. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, mm -hmm. I shall fear no evil, 
for thou art with me, right? This, he's talking about judgment. And uh, at a time before he is going to have a real problem with the judgment. But the lie there, I think, really to force this in here, to, to understand why this would be important, is that they're not just going to die and, and we're not all going to die in, in, in because of this in mortally, but we're all going to be separated from God. We are all going to go through judgment. And uh, that's kind of what he's saying, right? It's like, don't worry about it. Hmm. You know, you, you can partake of this. You, you can get back to the tree of life. You can be like the gods. Mm-hmm. But you don't need to worry about the judgment. There, you don't worry about judgment because yeah. I would I would submit that the the one of the ways to look at the knowledge the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is that it's the law of God and and that knowledge of good and evil through the law then provides you with I know it's good I know it's bad and now that opens up judgment as well and is going to bring bring judgment into the world and of course sure. what's not in the scene at the time is cherubim Mm -hmm. that comes in afterward Mm -hmm. and so the cherubim get put up in play in in front of the tree of life to guard it that would be the judgment right the judgment is now put in place once they've partaken of the fruit Mm -hmm. you can't get there you can't go through the judgment is holding you back and the only way you can get through that is by a savior being provided at that point. So that would be more the context on, on, on the side yeah. of, of the Latter-day Saints. And to be clear, because I've talked to evangelicals on this also about the part that he says, well, you can be as the gods. That, that is much more focused for us scripturally on the opening of the eyes, not of our potential. It is scripturally sound for a Latter-day Saint to say that being like the gods means that their eyes would be opened and they would know good and evil. They would have the full ability to exercise their agency. Is that yeah. how you understand Latter-day Saint thought? Um, it's As that's been explained to me, yeah. Uh, I, I will say that there's a couple of, of stopping points from an evangelical standpoint where we would say, you know, the reason why that doesn't really kind of add up for us is because even the, the idea that they didn't really sin in the garden, they just transgressed. I mean, Romans chapter 5 just flat out says it, that they sinned um, through through one man, you know, Adam, who sinned, sin entered into the world. I mean, that the, and whether you call it sin or transgression, regardless, it doesn't matter. What we're talking about is a holy God who is perfect and sinless. And when whether you transgress, whether you sin, anything that is less than holy at that point is going to result in we can't be around each other. I I, I cannot be around that as a as a, a holy god that is unclean or whatever. so um that that's a that's a deal breaker again this goes to the conditions of life my presence is where there is life where my presence isn't there is no life which is why when you're ba- banished from my presence and again you have this ancient near eastern idea of these cherubim with the flaming swords who who were always used in various cultures as guardians of sacred places the sacred place is the presence of god that's what. That's where we belong. Okay. If we move beyond intention, did God intend for us to fall? Did He intend? Okay. I, I, I've kind of already stated Ephesians chapter one. It was God's plan since before the foundation of the world that we would be adopted. Right. So He always had a plan for redemption. But when it comes to just the whole idea of um, being banished from His presence, we were meant for His presence in the same way that a fish is meant for water. Like it's that simple. Which is why what you see in Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 2, is a a place where through his promises and through his word, he restores all things. He brings all things into consummation in the new heavens and the new earth. And what you have in Revelation 22, verses 1 through 2, is a tree of life. Again, a representation of where God's presence is, that's where life is. That's where we have the full provision of... um, of, of life to thrive, of health, um, which is why in the previous chapter in Revelation 21, 
Um, it talks about there being no more death, no more sadness, you know, no more sickness, none of that, because we have everything we need in the presence of God, which is where we belong. So what happens in, in this fallen state, where you'll hear us talk all the time in mainstream Christianity, we're fallen human beings, we are sinful, we are uh, conditionally, we, we conditionally have a sin nature that we have inherited since the garden. We are constantly trying to find anything that will be as good as provision as the tree of life, that will be as good as provision as the life-giving presence of God. And we're never going to find it. it, whether it's um, earthly relationships, even good things, earthly relationships, family, job, success, money, none of it really fills us. So that, that is definitely a, a, a big difference because our, our, for us, our purpose originally is to be in a fallen state. There, there's hmm. that without being uh, us being in, a, in other words, the transgression or sin, whatever we call it, was necessary to be separated from God because that's what separates you from God. Hmm. That we had to be separated from God is is how we would look at that. We had to be separated from God so that we could work toward Him hmm. and 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 come back to Him and have the decision to do that and to grow in the process. It's kind of like. The word atonement, right, which is at one moment, and it's and covenant. It's mm -hmm. covenant comes from covenire. It is coming together, and in the, you know, the the Jews they wouldn't say you're going to make a covenant. They would say you're going to cut a covenant. That's karat barit, right, in Hebrew, and so that's why there's always this cut. And we even have, mm -hmm. you know, there's the blood oaths and different things where you cut your, you know, mm -hmm. that's all goes back anciently. To the idea of this karaperit, right? Cutting a covenant. And that covenant is then you have to separate the two. So we had to be separated from God. The way that happened is through partaking of the, 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 the fruit. And then there's the second half of the covenant, which is atonement, at one moment. God comes down and lowers himself down below us to come into the world to be born of a woman, to take on the sins of the world, and then overcome all of it. And then we are to look toward him and reach up toward him. And, and that's covenant for us, right? That's mm -hmm. being back at one with God, being reconciled with him. So the mm -hmm. reconciliation for us is not just, well, there was this big mistake in the garden. It's that was the plan that we would be separated from God and that we would through at one moment and covenant get back to him. Yeah. And so if, if I, I would then come back and say, well, why, like, why did it have to be that way? I know it's a little bit dangerous because someone could come to me and say, well, why did God create Adam and Eve with the potential to fall? And why did he allow Satan to enter the garden? There's a lot of whys that we, you know, might not have answers yeah. to, but why did it have to be that way? What, why does one have to fall? Uh, once they're in the mortal state, which we believe Adam and Eve were, why must they have fallen in order for them to um, be a part of God's fulfilling plan? Because it, why couldn't they just come to the earth in this mortal state and from there in the garden continue to understand what it means in that mortal state to, to grow and to progress and to, to exalt? The, yeah, I think it goes back to the idea again of the purpose of mankind. And that's where I think we might have a little bit of a difference there is hmm. – the purpose, you know, our first principle in, in the gospel is faith. And so it wouldn't, if we're there in the garden, there's not a lot of opposition or any opposition, and we're there with God already, there's no purpose for faith in that way of, of saying, how do I lean on this? And, and how do I enjoy the sweetness of the love that God had to sacrifice himself and to take upon himself the sins of the world? And then to bind myself to that and anchor mm -hmm. myself to that through faith as I lean on that. Yeah. And, and that without that, that we would never, for us, we would never be able to fulfill the measure of our creation without sure. ever having that, that separation and that need. It's like maybe, you know, when you have kids, I mean, what's the point of having, of ever being a kid to begin with? And that there's what you learn there. You hopefully lean on your parents, and that's part of your progression. And if you took all of that out and just said, boom, you're an adult to start off with, it would be a very different state of being, right? It would be sure. very different in the things that you're going to learn as you have to, you're, you're so dependent, where you, you have to lean 
on principles and you have to lean on truth yeah. so much. And, 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 you know, in that example, I think I'd, I'd say your parents, right. That you would be leaning on. Yeah. Well, and I think at some point to when we, when we kind of find ourselves going in circles in the cul-de-sacs of why, you know, trying to understand mm-hmm. all of the whys, because really we're, we're talking about the, the, the mind and the will of God. Right. And at some point we can understand it to a certain extent, but um, I think, I have found even in conversations with you, there's a, a little bit more of a productive conversation on whys when it gets into uh, the the prologue that Latter-day Saints have to the Garden of Eden, which is this pre-mortal existence and the differences that exist there, even in, um, again, it's it's in a little bit of a, of a mysterious space, but, but what happened before the garden? Mm-hmm. What was it like before the garden? I think that is probably a little bit more of a productive conversation to have as, as far as giving um, answers from a Latter-day Saint standpoint and even from a mainstream Christian standpoint. Um, because from what I understand, Latter-day Saints, you know, believing that um, all humans on earth are the spirit offspring of Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother. Yes. Um, and, and it was this um, presentation, if you will, of plans from jesus and lucifer as to how he was going to go about bringing us to a place of progression in an exalted Mm -hmm. state Mm -hmm. and where satan's was informed from more of a a prideful position jesus was was more of a um humble redemptive position do i have it right so far yeah yeah the plan all along was you know jehovah volunteers as the savior Mm -hmm. Uh, This is so again, we've got separate beings there. So the plan is the father's and Jehovah says, I volunteer to be the savior. I realize that there has to be a fall. Mm -hmm. There has to be a separation. I will be the savior and I will redeem the world. Yeah. And the thing I think that's important with, uh, with Lucifer on that at the time is, is that in our scriptures, what it says is that the reason he does this is through his pride, but it's he wants to remove the agency of man. Hmm. Right? That is his purpose. He wants to remove the agency of man and force something that is impossible, but that we see oftentimes in philosophies today and in addiction and a lot of other things, right? It's like he wants to remove the agency of man because then there's no growth. You can't have this full hmm. growth. And he wants all the glory. He wants to take all the glory from the Father. Can I can I go down a potential rabbit trail with that? Oh, let's do it. Let's do it. All right, Book of Alma, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, is 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 similar to the the folly of the Zoramites who had mm-hmm. this strong sort of almost Christless idea of an election as opposed to a more um, free volition or agency that Alma has to come in and correct and say this is wrong. Yeah, I think that's right. And and I think it's because if you notice in the Book of Mormon, as you've gone through it so far, you've got all these dissenters, mm-hmm. right, that fall away from the Nephites. That's really what the Book of Mormon is about. Every one of them, if you look closely, become anti-Christ. Mm. Every one of them, right, where they, they're removing the doctrine of Christ, which is descending below all in charity and humility and, and everything else. And it's a prideful state where you have the ram, rammy emptum where they're preaching from up on the high pulpit and and everything else so yeah i think right. that's exactly right i mean that's the example of pride and, so, and even lehi's vision it's the great and spacious building is pride and it's the juxtaposition of the tree of life which is really yeah. the doctrine of christ and how you that's where you're trying to get to is mm-hmm. be like christ and and the first shall be last and the last shall be first right the greatest among you is the least among you yeah, I find it interesting that even before I had any um, acclamation to Latter-day Saint thinking and some of the the narrative that exists there, um, this there's there's always conflict even in mainstream Christianity, especially in mainstream Christianity, uh, where the will of God and the where, the will of man how they interact, and mm-hmm. whether you're talking about issues of uh, original sin all the way to election and some of those other things, and th- we we are living we we always live in this tension of, well, where is the decision made? Where are the decisions made? And and what are the implications if God's will is lessened or if man's will is lessened? Where's that perfect balance? I think in in our um, paradigm, what we would say, kind of going back to this whole, you know, prologue, um, we we believe that the the whole point of putting 
the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden was so that agency could be had because what, what is love? What is devotion without choice? Absolutely. Right. So yeah, we agree on that. Um, and, and I think that's where, that's where I, I see the, uh, the grace and the mercy of God, you know, not the cruelty of God. Why did you create them if you knew that they were going to, they knew that they were going to fall? Well, how else should he have created them? It, it's beautiful that he created us to have that agency, to have that choice, uh, to, to take him up on the invitation to experience all that is eternally good that he has to offer us. Here's an interesting question, I think. So in the Garden of Eden, if they would not have partaken of the fruit... And, and since there's, you know, in, in the Protestant mind, there, there's no pre-mortal world for us. What? We would all be created at that moment coming into, or we are all created at the moment we're coming into mortality. Is that correct? We, we wouldn't, yeah. I don't know if we would use the term mortality. I know what you mean by that. I don't think it's, it's an incorrect term. It, it, it makes sense. But um, we, we are meant to be mortal, it's not that we are eternal, eternal consciousness, eternal intelligences that have the opportunity to then change form or, or adjust form into a mortal state. We are mortals, period, as mm. creatures. Okay. When God, when, when we are being knit together in our mother's womb, you know, Psalm 139, the mystery that exists between how life begins between conception and, and birth and all that other stuff is, is a mystery. It's in, the, it's in the heart and in the mind of God. And, but that is when we begin. We have a beginning, and we are meant to be mortal, whether it's in uh, an Edenic sense in the Garden of Eden, had there never been a fall, or whether it's in a resurrected sense, as we share in Christ's resurrection, unto life for eternity, it's still mortal either way. And by mortal, I mean we, we exist as a different substance from God, as those who have bodies— um, but also spirits, and we live in that resurrected state in a in God's life giving presence forever. So we don't really enter into mortality. We are mortals, and God is not. We're created as mortals. Sense. Yeah, yeah, we're created as mortals. So then, what would it have been like in the garden um, had there never been a fall? I don't know, but it seems as though it was set up so that there could be full provision. In, a, in, in paradise, essentially, with God, as long as obedience was upheld and maintained. Now, does that mean that 5,000 years into um, an Edenic eternity, that, you know, Grandpa Adam, who now has, you know, thousands upon thousands of grandchildren, can't get stepped on by an elephant and die? <laughs> I don't know. I don't okay. know. I mean, maybe is it a situation where the tree of life has some medicinal properties where it's like, oh, he got stepped on by an elephant. Quick, get him you know, a piece of fruit from the tree of life. I don't, I don't know. It's, it's mysterious. Well, again, this is a picture. What we do know, it didn't turn out that way. So my question actually was going to be, would no one then have ever been separated from God? Would there be no one that would ever have gone to hell in, in, in no evangelical one, terms? Uh, the, 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 the clearest that the scriptures say is that when God created all things and he placed Adam and Eve in the garden and the, the punctuation point was, was dotted when Eve was created um, for, as a helpmate to Adam. And now you have humanity, you have mankind in the form of male and female in God's presence. That is what we are meant for. Okay, that, that's, as, that's as far as I can say it. Now, mm -hmm. would there have been, could there have been, all I can say is that's what we're meant for. That's not what happened. And that's what we are still meant for, which is why Revelation 22, the Lord is trying to bring us back into that Edenic state with the tree of life in his presence where there's eternal provision. Okay. Um, another point of interest before I move forward on this is, is you talked about the council, that there is this mm -hmm. council in heaven, there's these other creatures of, of God that are there. So for us, we believe in that council in heaven, right? That, that pre-mortal world is primarily focused on that council in heaven, but the creatures that were there were us, right? Mm -hmm. That was us. Yeah. And, and so everyone that is the offspring of, of 
the father would have been those that were actually in that council to begin with. And in the Old Testament, it's called the Shod, right? It's, it's, uh, mm-hmm. um, but anyway, that's, so there would have been, as we look in Revelation 12, right, you've got a third of the host of heaven mm-hmm. followed the dragon, right? Followed Lucifer, but those were mm-hmm. our brothers and sisters, the way we see that. Mm-hmm. They had the choice then, they, they followed him and um, they were sent here. Yeah. Right. They're here, but they're right. not a different creature to us. These are. Yeah. These are the same people as us, just with not without a body. Right? Yeah. They, they and, don't and, receive a body. And we see them, to your point, as a different kind of species mm-hmm. in in the spiritual realm. Um, you've got seraphim. You've got cherubim. You've got angels and demons. Uh, even even Satan himself holds a really interesting office when it comes to his function and his role before his own rebellion and, and after his rebellion. Um, and we, we don't see any indication in the scriptures of a um, spiritual procreation taking place between Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother. We believe that it was God Almighty who, who was there from the beginning, the Alpha and the Omega, who from him for his glory created all things and brought all things into existence. So this is going to get into something that's another can of worms, which would probably be a whole other podcast with the whole idea of ex nihilo, where mm-hmm. he made everything, every substance, every atom comes from his very mouth. It didn't, he, didn't, he wasn't working with raw materials. Um, and and he, he created these beings. And um, there's more mystery in the spiritual realm because we aren't those types of creatures. Um, so we leave that in that mysterious realm, but we don't believe that we are the same uh, species, creature, or substance as heavenly beings. Okay, just a couple more questions on this then. What is the tree of life? The tree of life represents the presence of God that that we are meant for so that one can experience life and peace and wholeness. Um, Again, we're going to get into a couple, like there's a little bit of a range or spectrum as to whether it was a literal tree or metaphorical. Mm -hmm. I'm fine. I am comfortable leaning toward a literal tree. Um, I can give some opinions on what I think it was like. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I I believe it's both. Right. Um, that's the point. I mean, that's, again, I, I'm going I'm to keep going back to Revelation 22. Where God's presence is, there is life. That's the tree of life. The mm-hmm. tree of life is what we were banished, we were cut off from, because we were cut off from God's presence. And where God's presence is, there is life. And where God's presence isn't, there is death, which is why hell for us is where God's presence isn't. That is death. That's... um uh, that's w- the the best way that I could summarize what I think the tree of life is. Okay, yeah, and that's pretty close to what we would say, right? It's mm-hmm. it, it's uh, you know we in the Garden of Eden story in the Bible, there's no partaking of the fruit of the tree of life, but in Lehi's dream there is, and you can see this a little bit in its. Uh, um, there are allusions to this in the Bible as well, and and it's you know so us partaking of that means that we are consuming or living the life with God or living mm. a, li- a redemptive life, so to speak. Um, I like that, that would be yeah. With and then you get into a lot of, you know, it, it's almost midrash at this point. It's like, it's like uh, Christian midrash. It's, it's, I wonder if it was this, I wonder if it was that. Mm. Um, but, you know, I've heard some people kind of converse about, you know, when the tree of life was available and we're, we're eating from the, the fruit of the garden and God's provision there, that flesh wasn't being consumed. Mm-hmm. Um, and that there's even something symbolic about that, that, that life was held in perfect balance. And um, again, where God sort of uh, really reinforcing the, the seriousness of sin gets into even a sacrificial system where you're seeing death, where there's a, because sacrifices were eaten a lot of times in the Jewish construct. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and yet then we get to the end of all time and you have the lion laying down with the lamb and the, the leaves of the tree of life are the healing of the nations and there's provision through the, the river of life. So we're back in that place where life is held in perfect balance. 
Yeah, I would say just one extra caveat there is I would say with the tree of life for us, it is not just life, it's eternal life. Sure. Right. It would be exaltation is what we right. would be looking at there is it's yeah. uh, it's it's juxtaposed to the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a lot of people, this is hard for some people to accept, but, you know, even Latter-day Saints. But it's if you looked at the tree of knowledge of good and evil as the law, you're like, well, why? Why is that bad? Why is the law of God bad? Well, again, it's it's not that the law is bad itself. It's that the law is going to bring in sin. It, 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 you automatically bring in sin when you bring in the law. And the law is dead. We know this even in the New Testament teachings, right? The law is dead. It's a dead law without having Christ. Mm-hmm. Right? You have to have Christ who fulfills it, and, and you have to have the justice and the mercy that are, that are brought together there. So Christ, in a sense, would also represent that eternal life and that tree of life that is juxtaposed. In some ways, Jesus is actually killed by the law. Right mm-hmm. and is on a tree, interestingly, as they call it, yeah. because the the Sadducees, the high priests, the chief priests, they are going. They can't kill him because the Romans can only do capital punishment. But mm-hmm. they they assign to him basically blasphemy to saying that he is the Son of God, not just the Messiah. A lot of people said they were the Messiah back then. Mm-hmm. That's a different idea back then, and still is for the Jews today. It's not. A divine person it's not the son of god mm-hmm. and uh and so he says he's the son of god and they go into the law and say this is blasphemy and you're basically accused for death at that point so sure in some ways you know the yeah. law is dead and yet a opposite of that is is life with the tree of life yeah, that's an interesting thought. I've never, I've never heard the tree of the knowledge of good and evil tied to the law. What you're saying makes sense. I think what we would say is the the law only exists to teach an unholy people how to understand the holiness of God, which is why in the New Testament the law is called a tutor or a teacher. So there was no there was no need for a law. Um, and I know that you're speaking in sort of metaphorical terms, but there's no need for the the presence of law where um, where there is no sin. And the, the law is introduced in order to help mankind sort of understand the, the seriousness of sin and the holiness of God. So, yeah. What would change, this is my last point, what would change, going back to the idea of the redemption and a relationship with Christ based on his love, the love of God and what he did in his condescension, what would change then in the Garden of Eden if we never would have been in a fallen state and required that? How would that change us? I guess is, is the question a Latter Day Saint might have. How how would that change us? Never to have felt the joy and the sweetness of relying on a redeemer and and creating well, that bond through faith. We had that bond. What, okay. Why is there a need to change? Adam walked in the coolness of the day with God, and and that was disrupted when he sinned, which is why um, they hid when they heard him coming. It, nothing needed to change. It, we were the ones by stepping outside of God's preconditions for that setup for, for life, the conditions for life. So we wouldn't need to change. We we're existing in a fully satisfied state until an external uh, presence comes in to disrupt and distort that, which is what Satan did. Yeah. Okay. And again, I think that is the number one difference. I think yeah. there is, is is looking at that and and saying, okay, well, looking at the garden from a Protestant point of view, probably Catholic as well, is is it could have been different. It could have been a lot different for all of us. Could have um, for us. Should've. It would. Yeah. 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 For us, it would be well. That's required, and. We have to have the separation from God to have him, you know, actually express the love that he has for us to some degree in that separation and for us to have the faith in Jesus Christ and, and yeah. the atonement. I think that's, a, that's one of the primary differences in understanding the fall between us. There, there's two things I haven't said tied to that to sort of wrap up even to... to echo what you're saying because this is super important stuff i'm finding this uh, i think when we were talking on the phone yesterday about this or in sort of our pre-meeting i was saying this is sort of ground zero yeah when it comes to so many things about the nature of god the nature of man an understanding of sin and the mission of jesus like 
those are really foundational things. So it's really good that we're here talking about this because um, I, there's two things that I just want to reinforce sure. to that point. The first thing is this. We don't believe that Jesus was a plan B. I just want to make sure that's crystal clear. Me and uh, Luke Hansen, we, we kind of touched on this. on his. I did an interview on Cougar Chronicle last week. We only dipped our toe in the water because we knew that you and I were going to be having this conversation in greater depth. Um, but since I wasn't fully you know, bringing all of my thoughts and then people were getting the impression that I was saying that Jesus was a plan B. He wasn't. Okay. Ephesians chapter one makes it very clear. Jesus was never a plan B. It was always in God's foreknowledge that as he set things up this way, that he would be sending a redeemer to bring us back to him after through our volition and through the deception of Eve with Satan to bring us back to the garden. Okay. It was always his plan. Um, now, the, the, and this is probably the most important thing that I'll say in this entire interview. And that is the reason why understanding the differences in the garden is so important is because it directly impacts the why behind the reason that Jesus came, the why behind his mission. Mm -hmm. We would say that the mission of Jesus is God just swan diving into this fallen condition out of his unrestrained love for us through his grace and his goodness to bring us back into his presence because that is where we belong. And that is why grace just is volcanic with inside of me. The love of God, it just, it brings us to a place of, of born again praise and, and hope and excitement about the future because what was lost is now found through Christ. And that is why he brings us back into the tree of life, the presence of God. There is no night because God's glory fills the heavens. There is no ocean, and that's metaphorically speaking. Um, people who want there to be beaches in heaven, there probably will be. When it says there's no ocean, that's talking about this chaotic, judgmental symbol that exists throughout the Old Testament. None of that's there. Like we, we, are, we are destined for a beautiful fulfillment forever in God's presence because of Jesus. Um, and that is going to be distinct from a Latter-day Saint narrative as to why Jesus came to deal with the problem of sin, but to also put us on that path of progression so that we could find our way back to Heavenly Father, even in the celestial sense and beyond, to continue progression. And I, as, as I said this with Luke Hansen, um, and, and I would love to hear your thoughts on this. So to me, evangelical perspective, it seems that our gospel is about God and our rightful place before God, whereas a Latter-day Saint gospel is all about us. It's about God providing for us what we can have by progressing as individuals and as family units with the eternal family. And I don't know what, what your thought would be about that as I kind of... I like, completely disagree. <laughs> okay, good, good. Yeah, I'd love to I hear would completely disagree with that. Um, I, if it becomes all about us, then it's all pride. Mm. Right. Yeah. Now we're going into that step of, of well, that's uh, somebody else's plan mm. uh, that that we don't want to follow. And, and so that's it's kind of, uh, you know, I, I would suggest it's something like this. Right. It's I, I think that it's not that it's all about us at all. Mm -hmm. It's definitely all about God. And we would say even with Christ, we would even say beyond that for us in, in saying the God had his three different personages or three different people, entities. Mm -hmm. It's not even Christ. It's God the Father. And that all of the glory goes to the Father. And that was the example of Jesus Christ. He always did the Father's will. He always did uh, followed his bidding and, and gave all the glory to the Father. Right? That's, that's what we want to do. And the war in heaven to us from Revelation 12 is exactly that. It's Lucifer wanted to steal the glory of God and have us follow him. And through pride, right? That's what his pride was. Mm -hmm. And yeah. he, his plan would be to, to eliminate agency and to, to be able to accomplish that because you would have to have something like that in a counterfeit plan if you don't have a savior. Hmm. And, and so it's very much the opposite of that. It would be, I, I, I think of this in terms more like the, the discussion between Jesus and the apostles where, and this is in a world where hierarchical structure is very important, status is very important. Uh, most people don't move like we do in the West and modern West here between caste systems and, 
etc. And, and so hierarchy is very important. Even the Last Supper is all set up in a hierarchical structure. And, and there's always that question toward the end, like, who's going to be the greatest? Which of mm. us is the greatest in heaven? And he's mm. like, come on, this is... Come on, guys. Don't you get it? Look, the right. greatest among you is the least among you. And he actually mm. sets up John the Beloved next to him in the Last Supper, who's the youngest of all the apostles. And at the very end, all the way to the other side, is Peter. <laughs> he's, in the, he's in the position of least status at the Last Supper. And he's over by the door where there's... That, that's where the servant would be. The servant, right? And, and so I would look at it that way. The example of Jesus Christ himself, God, is that he is the servant. Mm. This is how Isaiah describes him. This is how the Lord tells him to describe him. He's the servant. He's the lowest of all of them. And, and he's the least of everyone. Hmm. But because he lowers himself below everyone through love and condescension, but he's also the greatest among us. So, so there's this dichotomy, right, that's like, and that's how we would look at this a little bit. It's like, look, you can't move anywhere anyway without mm -hmm. serving and having charity. If you go through the... Uh, well, I want to get to those in a minute in our next discussion. But um, <laughs> all of the, everything that has to do with the commandments, all of the teachings of Jesus are all about that, right? It, it's you, you've got to be humble. You need a broken heart and a contrite spirit. You've, so, so that is how we would view that. The difference, I think, in what you're bringing up, I think from an outside perspective and looking at that, yeah. is that we would just imagine going back to the, <laughs> the Garden of Eden, we, in our in, in our minds, what we would see is potential and purpose. Mm -hmm. Is is that our purpose is to us maybe known in that we are supposed to be more like our heavenly Father, right? Mm -hmm. More like Christ, mm -hmm. and and while it is about our progression, there's. There's no progression without being the least among everyone, mm. right? Mm. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, and I, I'm I'm glad that you take the time to to articulate that. This is, I I find myself doing this so often on Hello Saints, and I know for some people it's like beating a dead horse, but it's like this is why these conversations are important because in our respective echo chambers of confirmation bias with someone who agrees with me, I could make that statement, and we would be like, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Our gospel is about God, and their gospel is about them. But this is why these conversations are so important and healthy to give us the opportunity to say, this is my impression. T tell me if I'm, if I'm right or wrong. You're like, God, ah, I disagree with that. So I appreciate you clarifying that perspective for me. That's great. And actually, eventually down the road, I want to do another one on the Garden of Eden because there's a lot more I didn't get to here that I want to talk about. But uh, Sounds great. that's great. And I think that everybody should understand that it really is ground zero, right? When you go back to this, yeah. the, the nature of God, the purpose of mankind, the plan of God the doctrines that we pull from are are really in this capsule in the Garden of Eden. Yeah. And and uh, in that short little account, there is uh, there's an awful lot packed in there. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's 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 great that we're we're kind of going there because again, I, I've not heard enough Latter day Saints and Evangelicals or mainstream Christians go to Eden. And I think that's I think it's great that we're here. Yeah, that's great. Very good. All right. We are going to do a second episode. You and I are going to continue doing this now on works and grace. Uh, but for this episode, Jeff, really appreciate it. Thanks for coming back on. You're a good friend and love what you're doing, your openness and your willingness to talk. Uh, you know, we've talked about this before, but I, I think that the example of the Samaritan woman is really important here and mm -hmm. understanding that she's othered, right? She's different. Mm -hmm. And the apostles are all saying, what are you doing? <laughs> are and, you and he's going up to the well and, and he's talking to her. And, and yeah. you would see me and Latter-day Saints perhaps a little as the Samaritan woman. And we would see you and other evangelicals and Protestants as the Samaritan woman as well. And, yeah. and that's okay. That's yeah. okay. Yeah. We're having the conversation and the, 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 at the end of the day, our desire is to see God more clearly to understand the truth more clearly. And um, and I think that's a beautiful thing. So yeah, I I love that um, that we can have the, the, the fortitude to move beyond 
the well-worn paths of these types of conversations to have a new kind of conversation. All right, Jeff. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thanks, friend.